Hey, good morning, y'all. Uh, my name is Andrew, and together we are Oakland, and we get together every week to be reminded who we are and whose we are, that we belong heart, body, mind, and soul to the God of the universe, who created, in our, created us in our mother's womb, and then when we had rebelled against him, brought us back at the cost of his only son, Jesus. We're prone to forget that, and when we forget it, we live as though we are the center of the universe, and that causes us to hurt each other, to hurt ourselves, and to break God's heart. But thanks to Jesus, we don't have to live that way. We can be reconciled to God and use everyday moments to connect every part of every life to Jesus. Whether you believe all that, none of that, or you're not sure what you believe, you are welcome here as we all learn and grow and change together. Whether you're joining us in person or online, uh, we're so glad that you uh, have uh, made the prayerful decision to uh, be here in worship with us. Uh, we are still one church in many locations as we have a heavily modified worship service in this space. Uh, and then also uh, many people joining us uh, via the internet. I just want to say uh, we're so glad that you tuned in and pray that God will use this moment, these moments, this uh, next little while to impact your life and to lead you in the next right steps as you follow Jesus. I want to invite my friend Sarah to come and to give you our announcements for this week. Good morning. So this week we're excited that Wednesday night we're going to try doing, or not trying, we're going to do another um, virtual fellowship supper. The last one was a lot of fun for those of us who participated. It's a little different than a fellowship supper in person. But what we'll do is we have already posted, so you can start preparing, a recipe that everyone will make the same thing for dinner that night at home. And then on our Facebook page that night, starting around 5 o'clock, in case you prepare your meal a little earlier, um, we'll put some interactive posts. Things like, um, show us a picture of what your dinner table looks like, or show us a picture of you preparing your meal. And then we might even have some conversation starters that you can look at to jot down or just to have in the back of your mind so that you can have those conversations over dinner. And then maybe later on in the evening, pop back onto Facebook and put down what you discussed with your family. Um, my family does not have electronics at the dinner table, and we know a lot of people don't. So we are trying to make those um, interactions things that you can just kind of think about and then come back later to give your discussion or your feedback on instead of having to have the computer up during your dinner because we don't want that to distract from what you're doing right then at the dinner table. But it would be lots of fun. I think the recipe this, um, this month is a one-pan sausage, peppers, and potatoes mixture that you can make it looks really good i'm excited to try it um and i think too that with all the seasonal veggies that are out there right now you could even toss some squash or zucchini or something in there um make it your own at that point and then let us hear how you changed it up as well like how we can share that meal and grow off of each other even just in cooking is so much fun to me um so that is this wednesday the 29th the posts like i said on facebook will start around five o'clock and then just kind of check in throughout the evening to see other people's comments or to throw your own comments up there on those interactive posts on the Oakland Facebook page. Also coming up, we're really excited to partner with the Smithfield Rescue Mission to help them out with some much needed projects. They have a whole laundry list of things that need to be completed, which we unfortunately cannot do everything, but um, our mission team is going through that and picking out the things that we can do that'll make the biggest impact for them. And we're gonna do the work and provide the supplies for that. The problem, or not problem, but the, the issue that comes up with that then is that we need workers. We need people to sign up to come help us complete these projects so that we can bless the rescue mission. Um, on the Facebook page last week and then also in the weekly email, there has been a sign up form in there that you can mark down which days you're available to help. And we have all kinds of jobs that need help from going to buy supplies and bringing them up to the church or dropping them off at the Smithfield Rescue Mission or maybe painting. If you're good at painting, they'll have rooms that need to be painted that you can just come paint. If you like to build, they're gonna have some carpentry projects that we can use help with. Or if your gift is in helping make meals, we need a team to help um, the Congregational Care and Mission Team to make meals for our mission team that will be at Smithfield Rescue Mission so they can have sustenance while they're doing all this hard labor. Lots of different ways to get involved. If you have questions or have another idea for how you can help in this project, email me and I will get you in touch with the people um, that are organizing the different groups and then we'll make sure that everything is covered and planned for. It is a really big project to undertake that we've got lots of people doing different things and we can find a job for almost anybody um, to serve no matter what your skills or talents or likes are in serving. So if you're interested but you don't know how to help, email me and we will plug you in with the right group so that you can help out in some way with this project. Um, 
I think those are the two big things we have right now. I did want to mention as well that um, our Sunday school study has been going great. I've heard great reviews and great feedback from it so far. Um, we're doing Unshakable Hope by Max Lucado. We're on lesson three, but I feel like each week has been kind of a, a standalone mini lesson. So if you have missed the first three weeks, you could hop in and join us next Sunday and you would not feel like you have missed anything. And I would really encourage you that if you have Sunday morning before church available, um, online, we start the online class at nine o'clock and then in person, we start that at 930. We would love to have you join us for that study so you can just be built up and be reminded to build your life right now on the promises of God instead of our circumstances. Our circumstances have been not very hopeful lately. And so hopefully we're, we're leaning on the hopeful promises of God to get us through this and to look forward to the next chapter that is coming. Um, so if you're just feeling kind of down and drug through the trenches with everything that's gone on the last six months or so, I would really encourage you to check out this study. And if you're so encouraged by it that you want to catch up on the first couple weeks that you've missed, I'm happy to set schedule a set aside time where you and I can sit down and do those other lessons to catch you up with everything. So it's just been a great study and I think a big blessing to those who've attended. So I'd really encourage everyone to check it out if they're available. Let us come together to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the many blessings that you give to us. We ask that you help us now to quiet our hearts and minds to hear your word for us this morning. Help us to focus solely on you and on worshiping and glorifying you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is For the Beauty of the Earth. Please stand and sing with us. be seated. Uh, as we come to this moment in our service, we remember that we are not here groveling for God's mercy, but we have been invited into God's presence. We get to come to God, not because we've earned the right, but because we have accepted the gift. And so we come into this moment to be honest about ourselves and honest with ourselves about who God is, that we might repent of our sin and trust in God's grace. Let us confess our sin against God and our sins against one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we enter into your presence and confess that so often we live like Martha, busy, 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 concerned and anxious about many things. We have so filled our lives that moments of silence and stillness unaccompanied by music or books, TV or electronic devices and other people can make us profoundly uncomfortable to have to live with our own thoughts. And so we come into your presence acknowledging that we desperately need you, that nothing else will satisfy or cure, that our hearts and minds are deceitful. And yet you, God, are true and trustworthy, that you never change. You are the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. We come into your presence to live like Mary, to sit at your feet, O Jesus, and to hear your teachings, to apply them in our lives, and to be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. We want to be people who reflect your grace and mercy to the world around us, who tell the truth, who forgive, who love relentlessly and sacrificially, who are generous and hospitable, who speak life and sing with joy. We pray, Lord, that we would this week mirror your son Jesus, who came to serve rather than to be served. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who was and is the Christ, and reigns with you, Father God, in the power and love of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, the incredible news of Christianity is that you and I are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, that you and I now stand before God with no condemnation and no judgment. Instead, we stand before God with an inheritance and with grace and blessing and access. Friends, repent and believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As forgiven and reconciled people, let's stand and declare what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which are printed on the screen for you. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Claire, will you come and read, a, read our lesson from Romans chapter 12? Good morning, church family. All right, I'll give you a second to get there. We're going to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is the word of the Lord. I wanted to start this morning by just celebrating all you all and God have been up to over the last few weeks. Uh, many of you have seen some of the incredible stuff that's been going on, uh, but other things that have been happening behind the scenes uh, remain unknown to some of you. And you 
should have gotten an acorn this week, a newsletter. If you did not receive that and would like to, I'll make sure it gets up on the website this week. But we can also put you on our hard print mailing list if you email secretary at oaklandpresbyterianchurch.org. That involved a lot of updates and news and information, a lot of celebrations. Uh, but some incredible stuff's been happening around here. Uh, we have been able to uh, organize food drives to stock West Johnston Food Pantry. We've been working hard as a, a mission and outreach team to make sure that the blessing box at Palenta Elementary stays full. On uh, Friday, we had a blood drive here, and members um, and, and people in our church uh, put out a farmer's table for the food drive, I mean the blood drive participants, there were like fresh tomatoes and jalapenos that people could just get as a blessing to them when they were here giving blood, just people generously giving out of their garden. Our CE and Christian education ministry team has been doing an incredible job organizing online Sunday school classes. This morning there were um, you know, 10 or 12 people online, there were another 10 or 12 here live in person, but they've also been getting creative with our kids, sending out vacation Bible school materials to homes, uh, giving, uh, taking our youth on a tubing trip uh, last weekend, sending out chain letters, uh, making sure that we continue to get spiritual food on the plates of children and youth during this time. Uh, our Congregational care team has done an incredible job just collecting prayer requests, praying for folk, um, building out a prayer team who takes those prayer requests seriously, organizing the fellowship supper you heard about in a minute, um, and just working on taking care of the congregation. They've also partnered really well with uh, the mission and outreach team uh, to coordinate their efforts as we all um, are kind of displaced from this building more than usual. And so taking care of our congregation and taking care of our community become more and more uh, similar. Our property committee has done incredible work on major building upgrades, um, working in the youth center in the back, stripping um, the ceiling down and smoothing it and getting the drywall up to uh, snuff there, uh, working on uh, some painting projects. Uh, just this past weekend, there was a crew of people out in the yard um, upgrading the Internet so that when we uh, gather for things like this that are virtual and in person, and, you know, eventually with Sunday school classes and that, uh, our Internet in this building uh, is uh, up to code for us to be able to do the things that we want to be able to do to serve each other. And then one committee you haven't seen but who's been working prob as hard as any committee during this time has been our personnel committee who's just done incredible work um, conducting uh, major job searches and candidate searches, uh, filling in our youth director role, uh, hiring Sarah, realizing God was calling someone who was already here and raising her up, uh, then working on office administrators um, to, to replace Sarah's office administrative responsibilities. Uh, they're working on that and continuing to uh, search the Internet and the uh, and social networks and our own networks, literal people-to-people um, -people networks, uh, for someone who will be our next worship leader and choir director. Uh, they have been meeting multiple times every month uh, for months and months and months now and just uh, stop, just doing incredible heart work for us as a church. I bring all that up because as a church, we've had to ask over and over again, what does God want us to do during this season? What is God asking us to do during this season? Where is God leading us during this coronavirus? And last week, we sat down and talked about prayer. We have been focusing on uh, the difference between teaching someone to fish and giving people a fish, spiritually speaking. That often I can give you a lesson um, that teaches you information but doesn't transform the patterns of your behaviors. And so during this season, we want to focus on skills, not stuff. We want to focus on um, behaviors, uh, op these, these habits that we can form that help nourish our souls, that help uh, allow us to grow. And so we talked about Bible meditation, and last week we talked about prayer. And we uh, started off by asking the question, what is uh, prayer like? What is prayer like? And we looked at uh, a couple different pictures last week, but I wanted to show you a couple this week. Because prayer in different religions is a word that gets used widely and, and spread out, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an actual uh, a Buddhist monk who is praying in Nepal. And those things on the wall, are uh, they are Buddhist prayer wheels is what they're called. 
their prayer wheels. And the way he is praying is literally walking around this temple and he's running his hand across those wheels to spin them. And every time it makes a revolution, that counts as one prayer. He's actually got a mini one in his left hand. You can see that one. And he'll spin that uh, with this hand and then spin these with this hand. And he's getting, he's accruing prayers by spinning these wheels. He's not expecting to hear anything back. He is expecting to earn blessings. If you go to the next picture, uh, you'll see a different form of prayer. These are very famous around the world. You may have seen them in the United States. Uh, these are Tibetan prayer flags. Um, these are Tibetan Buddhists. Uh, they, they write prayers on these flags or they mass produce them by printing them, like silk screen printing them, and then they run them all up until it looks like, um, I don't know, the only, in the American South, the only thing that looks like that is a used car lot. Um, but... Uh, but those are their prayers, and the idea is that when the wind flaps it, you get credit for that prayer. You're accruing prayer credits um, so that you can cash those in for blessings later. That's a radically different idea of prayer than what we talked about last week, which was this next image. Um, this next image of having a f- conversation with someone you cannot see, but someone who is there nonetheless. A two-way, bi-directional conversation built to make a relationship. In Buddhism, many forms of it, there is not uh, so much a, a personal higher being as much as a, an impersonal force like in Star Wars. And so there's no one necessarily to talk to or to hear from other than uh, yourself. Christianity believes that God is distinct and personal and that God wants to communicate with us and wants us to communicate to him. And so last week, we offered this recipe for prayer. This recipe for prayer or it, it started with P is for praise, R is for repent, A, ask for others, and Y is for yourself. That we can model our prayers after the Lord's Prayer and use that to, to help us remember how we can pray. But today I want to ask the question, how does God talk back? I think many Christians believe this feels a lot more like Buddhist prayer than Christian prayer. In Buddhist prayer, it's a single direction conversation. And it doesn't even involve my mind a lot, just my wishes. But here in Christian prayer, there is a two-way street. And so I want to ask, does God talk back and how can we hear it? The book of Psalms starts with Psalm 3 verse 4 saying, I call out to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. He answers me from his holy mountain. What that refers to is the old ancient priest system. The holy mountain referring to the temple mount. And so if you wanted to pray, you uh, you would go and you would offer your prayers through a priest to God at the temple with a sacrifice. And then the priest would bring back word from it or at least absolution and dissolvement of your sin. And so God answered from his holy mountain. But in the New Testament, we see something radically different has happened. God is always speaking to his people. If we think about the book of Acts, we see a lot of different ways that God speaks. We see in the next slide that in Acts chapter 8, an angel of the Lord appears to Philip and tells him to go down to the desert road that leads to Jerusalem. A few verses later, the Spirit says to Philip, Go up to that chariot. In uh, this next chapter, Acts chapter 9, Jesus spoke audibly from heaven to Saul, who will become Paul. Go to the next slide, Jamie, if you don't mind. We see in that same story that the Lord spoke to a different man named Ananias uh, to tell him that Paul had been commissioned. And Ananias heard God tell him this. We see uh, later uh, that Saul is told in a vision that Ananias is going to come to him. I know this is getting old, but we're not done yet. Keep going. Uh, in Acts 10, we, had, we read this story a little while ago. Uh, Cornelius has a vision, and God tells him to sin uh, for a man named uh, Peter who's down in uh, Joppa. Then we also see uh, that Peter, at the, more or less the same time, has a vision where he sees a, a, a sheet come down with animals on it. And a few minutes later, he hears a voice saying, there's some guys getting ready to knock on the door. Go with them. That's really only just three chapters of Scripture in the book of Acts. We could go through the whole book. And the church individually and collectively hears from God over and over and over again. And so the question for us is, what about you? 
What about me? Did God only talk to believers in the book of Acts in the first century? Or does God still speak to us? And if God still speaks to us, how do we know that it is God speaking and not just the voices in my head? And there are some. And how do I know it's not just my imagination or um, I'm not going crazy, that I'm not um, turning into you know, some kind of a vigilante boondock saint, um, but I'm actually hearing and obeying the revealed will of God. And so I made up a real simple acronym for this because I didn't have one and nobody ever taught me one. And I think acronyms are helpful. That's why we used P-R-A-Y last week. Not mine, I stole it. That's so why we used the cross method the week before that. Not mine, I stole it. This one I made up. Somebody else probably has it somewhere else. But it's, and they probably have a better one. But for right now, uh, we'll use this one. Uh, able. Because we are able to hear God's voice. How are we able to hear God's voice? Uh, my acronym is ABLE. A is ASK. B is Bible. L is listen to God and others. And E is expect. This is our formula for hearing from God, from hearing from God. A is for ask, starts with asking of God, asking of God. Jesus himself says, ask, um, everyone who asks, receives, everyone who uh, seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened unto them. Uh, Claire taught me a mnemonic that the word ask is actually a mnemonic for that verse. A, ask, and you will receive. S, seek, and you will find K, knock, and the door will be open to you. You can memorize that verse right now by just memorizing one word. Uh, that's in, um, you learn that verse. Ask. God begs us to ask. He begs us to ask. He's over and over again saying, ask. Draw near to the throne. If you ask anything in my name, if two of you agree and ask anything in my name, then the Lord God hears you and will answer you. Um, God is going to answer us in all kinds of ways after we ask him. He speaks through um, nature and dreams. He speaks uh, in nature. We can see this in Psalm um, 18 in Romans chapter 1. I talk about God speaking through nature uh, in uh, dreams. God talks to Joseph in dreams and Peter in dreams and Nebuchadnezzar in dreams and Pharaoh in dreams and Peter in dreams uh, and Paul in dreams and all kinds of people in dreams. God also speaks uh, through other people, through pastors and leaders and prophets, uh, through other members of the church. But the key is, not all those voices are God's. Not every dream is inspired. Not every sunset, well, every sunset is a miracle, but it's not always a message. How do I recognize God's voice? How do I know when God is talking? And that's the next thing. I have to learn to recognize God's voice when it is God's voice and not just thoughts in my head, not just an aesthetic experience. So where, how can we learn God's voice? How can we learn God's voice? And this is where we get to the B, able. Remember, ask. B is for Bible. God speaks in a lot of ways, but God speaks nowhere more clearly than in his Bible. The Bible is the written word of God. In it, God speaks. The New Testament attests to this all over the place. The church will say God spoke through our ancestor David. David was speaking. God was speaking. Jesus himself will quote Moses a book of Moses, and say, God said. Moses wrote the book, but who said it? God said. And so in it, you hear, we hear God's voice. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All of Scripture is God-breathed God and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting, for equipping this man of God to be um, sufficient in every good work. Think about it this way. Will you go to the next slide? That's a picture of the Bible. Uh, this guy in the middle, many of you have heard about a million times. The guy on the left is my um, roommate from college, Goose. And the guy in the middle is my mentor from college, a man named Timmy Curlett, who we all called Curly. And the guy on the right is me uh, when I was 20, 21, somewhere in there. Um, this is at a, uh, I don't know, I think that's at a, it's at some kind of party. Uh, some kind of, and we're just hanging out and having a good time. Uh, but Timmy Curlett trained me in ministry and then he uh, went on and now he is a doctor in the army he is a, uh, a an emergency room doctor and a battlefield doctor for the U.S. Army and he um, went into the army so he could go to med school and just after uh, kind of finishing all that his wife got pregnant 
I mean, if you don't know how that happens, then uh, that's a different talk for a different time. But his wife was pregnant, and they were expecting their first child. And you know what happens if you're expecting a child and you're in the U.S. military. You get deployed. And so he gets deployed uh, to do his first tour uh, of duty in the Middle East. And he's terrified. And we're talking through this. How is my son going to know me? I'm going to miss the first months of my son's life. Will he even recognize my voice? Will he know my face? How will he know who I am? Even when I call on the phone, I can call and talk to him. But how will he know that that voice is daddy if he can't see me and hear me and hold me? And so Timmy came up with this great idea. He bought a bunch of these little books. These are recordable books um, from Hallmark. And he, wanted, he, was, he knew he wouldn't be there to read his son all the books in his own voice uh, in person. And so he bought these books. This one says, with lots of love for each of you. And he recorded his voice reading this book to his son so that every night his wife could sit there and flip the pages for their little boy. And their boy could hear his daddy's voice reading his daddy's book. And so that when Timmy called on the phone later from the sand pit, from the desert, something in that little boy knew, that's my daddy's voice. I know that voice. I've heard that voice. I've heard that voice in the book. That's not grandpa. That's not mommy. That's not the neighbor. That's not the, the, the grocery store worker. That's my dad. And when Timmy came home, and his son met Timmy for the first time face to face. And Timmy said, come here, you little rascal. His son knew this was daddy. He knew his daddy's face because he had learned his daddy's voice and his daddy's book. In the same way, you and I have been given a book where God records God's voice reading God's word to us. Your daddy knew that you wouldn't be able to see him face to face. Your older brother Jesus knew he would not be here to read to you the way that you expected him to, and yet he still recorded a book for you and dropped it off in your lap. That you might say at some point, when God speaks to you in a different way, when God calls you direct in your prayer time, or when God gives you a dream, or when God um, talks to you through Jamie uh, Williford, you would say, that sounded like Jamie, but I know that voice. That's my dad. That's my dad's voice. That was a message from God for me, and you were just the delivery boy. This is why Bible meditation is so important for us, because in it we learn God's voice for the spontaneous moments when we need to hear God's voice. Friends, before you start asking, why is God not talking to me? Make sure you're not neglecting the place where God has already spoken to you. You see, the Bible is the revealed will of God. Go to the next slide for me. God's word is the revealed will of God. These are our marching orders. These were the last orders given to us. And the Marines, um, I think, I've never been a Marine, and uh, that means I'm not a Marine, uh, but they have a... They're, they're to follow the last order given until they receive a new order. And pretty much everyone is, um, but uh, it's just called last orders given. You and I received last orders given in the Bible. And so often we ask, what does God want me to do? And God has already told us what he wants us to do. If you just read how we read today, we started by reading Romans chapter 12, which finishes with, then you will be able to test and approve what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. You will know God's will. Often we're like, what's God's will for me? What's God's will for me? Well, if we just read the next, all of chapter 12 and chapter 13, it would cover 85% of your life, guaranteed. Like you'd be like, I, I already, figured, the Bible just told me how to handle 85% of life. The other 15% of life, I'm going to have to use the rest of the Bible for or, you know, or I'm going to have to pray about it, I'm going to have to talk about Because it. it didn't tell you which address to live in. It didn't tell you how much to spend on a house. It didn't tell you um, who to marry. But it did tell you a whole lot. It's going to cover it. And so um, reading, reading God's word and letting the, God's word answer the most important questions first so that you then go to God with the holes in your prayers, not ignoring what he's already said. And the coolest way I have learned to do this is by praying God's word back to him. 
And so if we combine two weeks ago and last week, we actually see this incredible thing. You remember the first question in Bible meditation on the cross one? Cross points up, and so we ask, what do I learn about God? And the P starts for praise. So if I read the Bible and I learn something about God, and then I go to prayer, well, what do I praise God for? What I just learned about God. I just learned something about God, so I praise God for this. So go to the next slide. Yeah, there you go. You did great. And then I, the next question is, what do I learn about human beings, right? Well, the second part of prayer is repenting. And so as soon as I learn something about human beings, I can repent of it. If it's, if it's good, I repent of the places that I haven't lived into it. If I learn something bad about human beings, I just acknowledge that I am one and that's true about me. And then the next, the next two questions are, how does this, um, or does it have a command or an example? It has a command and an example. Then I'll fall into asking for others and for myself. For others and myself. And so it's anytime I read the Bible, I can immediately pray God's word back to God. I can immediately turn around and ask God um, to bless folk in the ways that God wants to bless folk. With the commands and the examples that he has laid out for me. Remember a minute ago we talked about a dad who wanted his son to know his voice. Think about how children learn to speak. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German martyr, says, So we must learn to pray. The child learns to speak because his father speaks to him. He learns the speech of his father. So we learn to speak to God because God has spoken to us and speaks to us. By means of the speech of the Father in heaven, his children learn to speak with him. Repeating God's own words after him, we begin to pray to him. Bonhoeffer has this profound insight, which is you learn to speak by imitating your mama and daddy. You learn to talk to your mama and daddy by just trying to say what they said. And so we learn to speak to our Heavenly Father by trying to say what he said, by imitating his speech. That quote comes from a book called um, The Psalter, the prayer book of the Bible, or the prayer book of the Bible, where he teaches you how to pray psalms, where you just read a psalm and then pray it back to God. What's really beautiful about that is it drives me and, it drives me and my wife when we do it uh, before bed to pray for other people. Because I read psalms all the time, and many of them have no relation to my life. I'm not being chased by anyone. I'm not being, nobody's trying to kill me. Nobody is oppressing me. I'm not sick. And so when I get to that one, how do I pray that? Well, I can't pray it for me because it doesn't apply to me. But it does apply to one of my brothers and sisters somewhere in the world. And so I pray for the person who is being chased, the person who is being threatened, the person who is sick. And God is leading me into that prayer. And so that's the first step is praying God's word back to him and trusting that God is speaking to me when I read God's word and that he wants me to move into those prayers. Uh, The next one's, I'm going to try not to spend, uh, the next one is what I like to call a listening prayer. Listening prayer. I sometimes call it centering prayer if you are familiar with like um, different forms of uh, spirituality that would be. My brain won't work. It's okay. Um, my brain really wants to find that information. Um, it's in there. It's just not coming, so it's okay. Um, listening prayer is when I sit and listen to God. Uh, I think of it this way. If you go to the next picture, listening prayer is like going through your purse, ladies, where you just dump out your purse and then sort it in front of God. You ever done that where you just like it's been months and months and months and stuff accrued in this? I don't have a purse, but I do have a toolbox. And after months and months of toolboxes, you open it and you find all kinds of things in here. Now, obviously, there's a tape measure. That's pretty handy. But there's also a cord switch from 1973. Why this is in my toolbox, I don't really know. Um, Here's another one. At some point, I needed lots of switches. That's probably the one that was replaced um, and doesn't work anymore. And there is a hole for putting the the pole up in your closet to hang clothes on because that's a good place for that to live. I might need it sometime. Um, Anybody's brain ever feel like that? Just cluttered, just junk everywhere? You go to God in prayer and all of a sudden there's just stuff. 
it's like I got feelings and thoughts. I got to-do lists and shopping lists. I got worries and fears and hopes and dreams. I got a vacation I'm looking forward to. I got a job at work. Listening to prayer, uh, I think of it as two ways. One is sitting across the table, me on one side, Jesus on the other side, and I dump out everything inside of me in the, onto the table. And then Jesus and I, one at a time, pick up each object and look at it. We look at every thought in my head and every feeling in my heart, and we just pick it up and we look at it. And I say, Jesus, what's this? Why is it here? Is it important? And then I'll move on. That's the, that's the first image I use in my brain when I'm thinking about listening to God. The second one is a, of a river like this. I think of me and Jesus sitting on the bank of a river, and there's all, all my thoughts are just running down the river. They're just, you know, they're just floating like inner tubes on the river. All my thoughts. There's Jack and what I'm going to do about his school. Uh, there is uh, that house project that i got to fix eventually. Uh, there is the next time I can go fishing. Uh, there is um, our staff meeting on a Tuesday morning. Um, here is the other thing. And they're just floating down the river. And all I'm trying to do is sit with Jesus and just point to him and watch him and talk to Jesus about him and say, Jesus, is that important? What does that mean? Why is that there? What I find is that if you pay attention to what sticks, God will often show you things that are important. Your fleeting distractions will generally keep going, but the things God wants to impress upon you will stay. Those will often be scriptures or songs or feelings uh, or people who you just can't get out of your head. Feelings, uh, I said that, uh, things that didn't come from you, things that seem like they're just stuck on you, like Velcro or uh, cuckleburrs, uh, when you used to go out in the field and you would get those things stuck all over your britches. Uh, think about the things that stick. If you are going to God in prayer and you thought you were going to be praying about your job, and yet when you get there, you cannot, your coworker's face won't go away. Or you're driving down the road and you're just trying to worship God and every time you try to sing to God, uh, you see your nephew. Or you, you, you just keep remembering this memory. Use that as a prompting to pray for God, that God is telling you. And I, if, you're, if you're so bold, call that person and just say, I don't know why, but I can't stop thinking about you today. Is everything okay? Everything going good? I just wanted you to know that I've been praying for you all day. You often find that that person was going through something. And God was telling you. I do this in two forms. The first is silent prayer where I sit and watch. That may be in a chair in here or it may be in a deer stand out there. But it's a, long, it's a, it's a period of silence where I'm sitting there often with my eyes closed and I'm just, watch, I'm just listening. I'm just seeing what bubbles up. I'm not trying to talk to anybody. I'm not trying to say anything. The only sentences I really form are, Jesus, I'm listening. What's that? Is it important? <laughs> like those are pretty much it. Uh, but if that's not working and I'm getting distracted or whatever, I can go to the next one, which I call journaling prayer, which is to write out a letter to God and see what God drives my hand in. Often in the journaling prayer, I will parse it using uh, the serenity prayer. If you know the serenity prayer, our youth taught you an incredible way to hear God answering your prayers using the serenity prayer was that two or three years ago, Jamie? Um, two or three years ago, they showed us this. Right now, there are a lot of morally ambiguous scenarios where you're having to make decisions. Moms and dads, you're trying to figure out school. Grandmas and grandpas, you're trying to figure out if you can go to your kid's birthday party. All of you are trying to figure out, do I order groceries online or do I go in person? Do I wear a mask or do I not wear a mask? Do I have this um, operational procedure now or do I push it off? Do we expand onto our house and put on a swimming pool because I'm tired of being hot and it's 100,000 degrees? Or not. None of those have an easy, obvious answer, except for maybe the swimming pool. Um, and so in those situations where I can't see the right answer right away, or it's just really difficult and complex, I parse it using this simple sentence. The first clause in the serenity prayer is, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And so when I'm trying to hear God's voice and God's will, and I've already read the Bible, I will sit down and write out everything I cannot change in the situation. If it's a medical issue, I can't change that I have it or that the diagnosis happened. I can't change uh, how contagious this thing is. 
Second clause, though, is, and the courage to change the things I can. And so I'll immediately journal about everything I have control over, everything I can change. And the last clause and is the wisdom to know the difference. The wisdom to know the difference. Because I'm a sinner, and I don't think God, deep down inside of me, there's a piece of me that doesn't believe God knows how to do his job or that God is trustworthy enough to get it done in a timely manner specifically my timeline. And so after I've talked about what I can't change and what I can change, I will go back and on top of each of them, I will write God's to-do list over everything I can't change. I say, God, here's your to-do list. In case you were wondering, this is what you need to do this week. And God didn't need me to tell him that, but do you know who did need me to tell God that? Me. I needed to delegate that stuff and give it away. And then I go to the next list, which is the list I never want to go to because it is far more fun to worry about the things I cannot change, to fret over them, and to try to take God control back from God over that. When in reality, there's a whole list of stuff that I can change, that I have courage on, and I have to write on the top of that list. My to-do list. And then I need wisdom and courage and step out on faith. The last one is the one we're going to talk about a lot tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week, which is um, listen to others. When you are list- want to hear God's voice, when you are seeking God's will, listen to others. Listen to God first and then listen to others. When you are trying to hear God, God will often speak to you, but because he knows that I have a hard time hearing him, and I'm just not sure if that's his voice or my own thoughts, he'll look over and tell Ed. And without knowing it, I'll ask Ed some advice or an opinion, or I'll say, hey, Ed, could you pray for me? And and, and Ed will mirror back to me what I've been hearing in prayer as a second to God's motion in my soul. The old saints called this the inward sense of call, what God is calling me to inside my own heart, and the outward confirmation of calling. And God speaks in both ways. There would be an internal sense and an external confirmation. And so I need to open my ears to others. And this, friends, is why it is so important that we try to do this as families. Because I need to be in prayer. But God wants to speak to me through other people. And God wants to speak to Claire and to Jack through me. In the book of Acts, most of the words from the Lord didn't come to someone, but they went through someone. They were were things like, hey, go minister to that person. Or y'all better tell the church this. Or go love on this person. Not often was it just, hey, this is just a secret between me and you, and I just wanted to breathe this on you. That does happen. But usually it's for somebody else. And so I want to be praying with my family and with my church and with my community. I want to be letting that prayer, that listening prayer. Hey, I was praying for Oakland the other day, and I just had this impression upon me. It just wouldn't go away. I've been thinking about this forever. Hey, does that mean anything to you, Andrew? We're going to talk more about how do we pray with and for other people out loud next week. But this week, I pray that you will sit in prayer and listen to God and what God wants to say to you. Because God still speaks. First, through his book. Second, through his spirit in your soul. Third, through the external confirmation through his church and the believers he's placed around you. And when he speaks, it's still incumbent upon us to trust and to act to act so let's pray God we realize that our minds get jumbled up like our purses and our toolboxes and our tackle boxes and the back the bed of our pickup trucks and we need you to parse them for us to show us what's important and what's trash to show us the treasure we've long since lost God I realize that far too often I've done all the talking in prayer and none of the listening and just like your word says For us to be slow to speak, slow to become angry, and quick to listen. I pray in prayer we'd be quick to listen. Quick to listen, slow to speak. 
So in this moment, I just want to give my friends a second to listen to whatever you're bubbling up inside of them. Make it as clear as day and as sticky as slime that they might know it's from you. Somebody here who just keeps hearing over and over again, God talks to other people, but not you. The thought just won't go away. It's a lie from the pit of hell, a lie from the enemy. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God wants to speak to you. God, we acknowledge that we have gone our own way. The Bible calls this sin, but we believe you, Jesus, died on the cross to save us and to reconnect us to God, that we might not just have access to the riches of heaven, but we might have access to the ruler of heaven and call him daddy. So we commit to following you for the rest of our lives, to praying as long as there is breath in our lungs, not because we have to, because we get to. In Jesus' name, amen. Trusting in Jesus, let's sing these last words, holy, 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 as we sing our hymn together. Is that right? Ooh, that might be the wrong hymn. go now to God and offer prayers for others and for ourselves and thank him for all the wonderful blessings he has given to us. 
Father God, we thank you that you are holy. And we thank you that you continue to speak to us today just like you did so many, many years ago. Help us to remember that and to believe that, Lord, and to seek to hear your voice. We pray now and ask that you open our ears. Help us look for ways that you're speaking to us through your word and through other people. And that we expect, Lord, we don't just hope, but we expect to hear you speak to us. God, we come to you now and we lift up those around us who are hurting, those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for them. We pray for healing, Lord. We pray for strength and we pray for comfort. We ask that you be with their family members and their caregivers and that you give them strength and patience and compassion as we know how grumpy we can be when we're not at our best, Lord. God, we pray for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Comfort them in their grief and give them peace. Lord, we pray for those who are being oppressed by others, those who are being discriminated against for any reason, those who feel persecuted for their beliefs. And we just ask that you wrap them in your loving arms, Lord, and we ask that you put an end to all the division that's going on in our world. Bring peace to your world. We pray for our leaders. We pray that you will give them wisdom and integrity and that you will guide them into the rules and the laws that they are making. We pray especially for our Board of Education as they've had some very difficult decisions to make and we just ask that you be with them and help them to always be seeking your will. Lord, we pray for this church, that we can always be a pillar in this community, a place where people can come to find redemption and restoration. We pray that you will guide us into seeking your will for Oakland, bring about harmony and unity and peace among all of our members. And we look forward to the day that we are all able to be back in this place worshiping together. But until that time, help us not to stop worshiping, Lord. God, we thank you for all that you do for us and for the lessons that you are giving us on prayer. And we thank you for teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's benedict each other, let's bless each other, commission one another to go out into the world and to do God's will by using this uh, prayer of St. Francis, um, we'll say this together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring love. Where there is offense, let me bring pardon. Where there is discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there is doubt, let me bring faith. Where there is despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. O oh Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that one receives, it is in self-forgetting that one finds, it is in pardoning that one is pardoned, it is in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Friends, now to him who by his great power raised Jesus from the dead and is able to keep you spotless and blameless until his appearing before Lord Jesus, to him 
be honor and glory in the church and in all of creation. Amen. Amen.